morning and welcome to the Monticello Church of Christ. Today and for as long as we need to, our services will be broadcast through social media via Facebook, YouTube, and local radio, WFLWAM 1360 and WFLWFM 95.7. Uh, we want to take the opportunity to thank all those who, who come together and make this sort of thing happen. There's a, a wealth of knowledge and expertise as far as getting services like this broadcast and uh, all those folks behind the scenes who help keep the rest of us organized. If this is your first time watching, we are happy to have you. We encourage you to share this service with your family, your neighbors, your friends, and when things get back to normal pace, we would love to have you come out and actually join us in person. Our world, our country, our state, our community, and our church families are presently facing perilous and uncertain times because of the current coronavirus pandemic. One important certainty we do have is God's word and his promises. Matthew 18, 20 reads, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We can be certain that the church is not a physical building, but members of his spiritual body. Helping with services this morning, 
uh, would like to mention. Uh, wording our opening prayer will be Brother Sean Crabtree. At the appropriate time, Brother Dale Reagan will be wording the Lord's Supper. Brother Ralph Davis will be giving us the lesson this morning. And at the appropriate time, Brother Floyd Jones will be wording our closing prayer. Looking forward just a little bit, next Sunday, Brother Sean Crabtree will be bringing our lesson, and the Sunday following that, Brother Barrett Harris. As we move forward, let us uh, please remember the sick in our prayers, as well as those who provide their care and see to their needs. Let us also remember those who perform those necessary functions that keep our country and our society running. We'd also like to take this opportunity to request a special prayer for those families in our area who have already lost loved ones to this virus. In connection with our church family, please remember Sister Betty Markham in our prayers. Her sister, Golda Drossett, passed away Thursday, and Miss Golda has been on our prayer list for quite some time. And in compliance with social distancing requirements, all funeral services are currently being private, but that doesn't keep us from many other avenues uh, to express our condolences. The flower shops are still operational. Um, They're still taking orders by phone and internet, so many other ways. Or you can simply um, make a phone call, maybe send a card. Uh, we just want to show Miss Betty that we, uh, we're thinking of her, we love her, we care for her, and she's in our prayers. Remembering those uh, in connection with our church family and those that are in our church family, we like to remember them mention them by name. In our church family, Jim and Pat Nork, Dennis and Charlotte Walker, Mary Weston, Carl and Brenda Reagan, Billy Crouch, Cora Eller Sturgeon, and Jocelyn McCranick. Those in connection with our church family, those family and friends, uh, Betty Wright, Mary Burke, Jeff Parmley, Gladys Dennis, Austin Smith, Alan Frost, Larry Criswell, James Sloan, Janie Wilhunt Jones, Margaret Stevens, Jason Patton, Frankie Davis, Stuart Gregory, Stephen Markham, Roxy Dalton, Lowell Branscombe, Sandy Montgomery, Glenda Stevens, Bill Harris, Rocky Perkins, and uh, I spoke to uh, Brother Lloyd earlier and he said uh, Rocky had been sent home from UK and, and uh, families uh, facing some uncertain times ahead, so please remember them in your prayers. Robert Tucker Jr., Lloyd Morse, Wanda Markham, Vicki Rankin, John Perkins, Mark Kuntz, Donna Sloan, and Silas Ward. Those in our military, Chris White, Austin Crabtree, Harley Bells, John Frost, and Samuel Sonola. On happier notes, we would like to congratulate Macy Blevins for an outstanding junior year on the Wayne County girls basketball team. She is now the all-time leading score in the program has surpassed 2,000 points this past season. She was also named to the All-District, All-Region, and All-State basketball teams. She is the daughter of Shane and Angie Blevins and sister of Trey. We also want to congratulate Dalton Carter for being accepted into the Auburn University College of Veterinary Medicine this fall. He is the son of Shan Shannon and Kelly Carter and brother of Emma. We, uh, we want to say congratulations to them and let them know how proud we are. Even though we are not printing the bulletin during this time of quarantine, we ask that if you have any prayer requests or any announcements or anything like that uh, that you may have, uh, please send those to Ralph and he can notify the rest of us and uh, kind of get the, the needs and the prayers out to where those those need to be met. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll continue on with our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to assemble together. Lord, we know we're not assembling together in person, but we are assembling together in spirit. And we know, Lord, that you understand the circumstances and, and you know that we're not together out of love that we have for our brothers and sisters, that we don't want to spread this virus that's going around. 
And Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for businesses. We pray for our family members. We pray for everyone who's been impacted by this uh, COVID-19 virus. We pray for the healthcare workers and the public health workers and everyone who is responding. We, we just pray for everyone, Lord, that uh, they can get through this uh, with as much with as much grace and with as much understanding and with as much patience as possible. Lord, we are thankful for all the good things that we have in our lives. Lord, we're thankful for our health. We're thankful for our homes. We're thankful for our families. We're thankful for all these good material things that we have. Lord, we realize we would not have any of these things if it wasn't your will. And Lord, we pray most especially for our great spiritual blessings. We're thankful for the church that we have and the love that we share amongst our brothers and sisters. We're thankful for the Bible that we have. We pray that we would study and use it daily. Lord, we're thankful for the avenue of prayer in which we can approach you and, and communicate with you. And Lord, we're thankful more than anything for your son, Jesus. We're thankful that uh, you were willing to send him to this earth knowing that he would be a sacrifice for our sins. Lord, we're thankful that he was willing to come to this earth, that he was able to live a perfect life, and that he was willing to go to that cross to die for our sins. Lord, we know that when he died for us, he took the punishment that we deserved to give us the hope that one day we might be able to be in heaven with him. Lord, our prayers go out at this time for everyone who's mentioned on the prayer list. We pray that you would be with uh, each and every one of those and help them and provide for them as only you can. And Lord, we pray for any who might be bereaved at this time, that you would help them and comfort them through their time of need. Lord, we pray that as we go through this upcoming week, that we would uh, understand that it is our jobs as Christians to let the love that, that you've shown us flow through us and show out to those around us. We pray that we would be kind and merciful, that we would spread your gospel that we would do all these good things, Lord, and do them in your name, not taking any of the glory for ourselves. And Lord, we pray that you would go with us through the rest of this virtual service. We pray that everyone who's, who is tuned in, either by way of radio or across the internet, is able to feel the sense of spirit that we have amongst each other. And we pray that we can be fulfilled in this worship. And Lord, we pray that this worship honors you and lifts you up and is pleasing in your sight. Lord, we pray that we would be the good Christians that we're supposed to be. We offer this prayer humbly in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
as we eat each Lord's Day, we always remember our Savior Jesus before he, whenever he died and rose again. And to prepare our minds, we'll read from uh, Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning verse 14. When the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With a desire I have a desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave it to them, gave thanks, and break it and said unto them, This is my body, which is given for you, do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for the bread. To Christians, it reminds us of the body of Jesus who suffered, died on the cross for our sins. Help us to do this in a way that would be pleasing to you and would help us to always be thankful that we do have a Savior. We ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Father, we're thankful to you for the fruit of the vine. To Christians, it reminds us of the blood shed on Calvary for our sins. Help us to do this in a way to be pleasing to you. Always remember that we have a Savior and his blood will cleanse us from all of our sins and keep on cleansing as long as we live in the light of the Lord. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Monticello Church of Christ, I want to join in with Anthony this morning uh, to welcome everyone to our services this morning. Uh, we want to especially thank those of you who are watching and listening this morning. And if you don't have that capability, we want to thank all of those of you who are listening by way of radio, the way we normally broadcast our services each and every Sunday morning. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that we call change. Change. Change has happened to a lot of us in the last few days. This is what everyone is talking about. Change. Everything that has happened to us that has changed our lives completely in the last few days. How quickly and how drastically all of our lives have changed. How the whole world has changed. Not just us in Wayne County or us in Kentucky and are not just us in the United States, but the whole world had changed. I was reminded of this this past week when I got an email uh, newsletter from uh, the preacher over in Athens, Greece, where we were able to worship back in August. Uh, his newsletter was telling everyone here in the States that exactly the same thing, they're going through exactly the same thing that we are. They're, they're uh, having to stay in their homes, and they're not able to 
assembled publicly, not able to worship publicly, and and so pretty much all of us are in this same boat together. For the most part, it seems that you know we like change. We like a lot of things that change in our lives. Times. We look back at the times when we grew up and think back on the things the way they used to be. Back then we referred to them a lot of times as the good old days. But some of those things uh, we might want to go back to, but most of them we just want to think about them, I guess. I mean, I don't want to go back to plowing tobacco with a mule or hauling square bales of hay and tobacco in August when it's over 100 degrees. And some of those things, I wouldn't take anything for them, but still, I wouldn't want to change and go back and, and do those things. All of us like new cars. All of us like maybe a new house or new clothes or maybe even a new phone. But those things have happened to us over a period of time. They don't change. They haven't changed quickly. A lot of times, these new things that we acquire, it takes a process for us. It takes time. It takes thinking. It takes planning. It takes saving, it takes uh, looking back and doing these things over a period of time. To be comfortable with change, we, we need some time to, to get used to those things, don't we? Quick and unexpected changes in our lives causes turmoil. It causes frustration, it causes anxiety. It takes us completely out of our comfort zone whenever things change in our lives that we don't feel like we have control of. We're forced to do things that uh, maybe we would not do otherwise. And certainly, uh, this is what this virus has done to all of us. Our lives have changed completely. We hear people talking about nothing like this has ever happened in our lifetime, and of course that's true. Uh, nothing, uh, we're certainly in uncharted territory. We're, we're, we're struggling to find our way, it seems. After all of these things that have happened in the last two or three weeks, the big bombshell, I guess, that was dropped on all of us as Christians was the idea or the thought of not being able to publicly assemble the way we had done for all of our lives, so the traditional worship where we come together, especially on Sunday morning, and do the things that we find that the early New Testament Christians were doing on the first day of the week. We were forced to have to think about those things. It was not easy, it was a shock. Our first impulse, or at least I guess my first impulse was to just, you know, well, to be self-righteous about it and say, well, you know, they, they can talk about that all they want to, but that's not gonna be able to keep us from assembling like we always have. And that was the first impulse that a lot of people had. I've stood up here before and, and down in the audience as most of our men have in this congregation and in our public prayers we have, we have prayed to God and thanked Him for the privilege that we have to be able to assemble. And we think about our brethren who are scattered throughout the world that we hear uh, news stories about that they're not able to assemble, that they are being persecuted and they they are having to hide and do whatever they have to do in order to assemble. And of course, we always pray that, you know, that wouldn't happen to us. And certainly we will continue doing that. But never in our wildest imagination would we have dreamed about what has happened to us today. What has happened to us in the last two or three weeks. Interesting enough, I follow this congregation uh, out in Missouri. Uh, they're on, I guess, on Facebook, and I've listened to the preacher and some of his sermons. And a couple of weeks ago, when this first came out, and it, they had a lesson that they were going to have two weeks ago, and the name of it was Jesus and the Coronavirus. But it caught my attention, obviously, so I thought, well, I'll listen, and maybe there might even be some points there that makes a lot of sense, and I could even use them myself later on, but... So Carol and I got a quiet time and we decided to listen to it a little bit and I started and it didn't take me long to realize that this was not going where I wanted it to go. It was not, they were not reflecting my thoughts at all because the idea was that God's going to take care of us and we're going to assemble and we're not going to worry about the virus and all this and that. So, you know, for some reason that just did not sit well with me at all. All of a sudden, we found ourselves facing a new challenge to our faith. 
Christians have always had faith, but we didn't and don't engage in things that are dangerous to our health on purpose or deliberately. You stop and think about it. We have faith in God that he will take care of us, and certainly that is true. But even though we have faith in God, most of us wear a seatbelt whenever we get in a car, whether we're driving or riding. Why? Why? If you go to the lake, most of us wear a life jacket, or at least we have one available because not only that that's what the law requires, but we don't want to endanger or jeopardize our, our health or our safety. I don't plan on jumping out of an airplane anytime soon, but if I'm sure if I did, I would make sure that I had a parachute that was working. Why? Why? I have faith in God, but I'm not going to handle deadly snakes. I have faith in God, and I'm not going to drink deadly poison. God has given us the wisdom, I think, to have the common sense to be able to make decisions that's not going to purposely endanger our health. I read this statement uh, a week or so ago, and it really made an impression on me. All of a sudden, to assemble publicly equated to driving drunk up the interstate in the wrong direction. Now think about that. Driving drunk up the interstate in the wrong direction. You might or you might not kill yourself, but more than likely, you're gonna be responsible for killing or injuring other people. All of you might remember this gentleman by the name of Larry Mahoney in 1988, got in his pickup truck drinking up on the Interstate 71 between Cincinnati and Louisville near the town of Carrollton, and he collided head on with a bus, a bus loaded with people, and a lot of them were children. And uh, when it was all said and done, there were 27 of those people that died. 20, most of them were children. He didn't kill himself, but he certainly endangered the lives of others. So I don't know whether this is a fair uh, uh, comparison or whether you can equate it or not, but it kind of makes sense because we know that people have assembled in Kentucky and when they were not, when they were told not to, and they, uh, and the virus infected quite a few people. And not only that, but that affected the lives of a lot of people. After everything sunk in, we started looking for alternate ways or alternate methods of assembling that we might feel that we do feel that is acceptable to God. Unbelievable opportunities with technology exist today. It's just, uh, it's just amazing. And uh, so here we are, here we are today, and we're all assembled together this morning, and we're not in the same building, but we're assembled together in the same spirit, and we are doing basically the same things we would be doing if we were all here this morning. I've quoted this a few times, kind of probably not exactly right, but uh, the statement, the only thing that never changes is things change. You have to think about that a few seconds. The only thing that never changes is things change. But that's not exactly true. That's true to some extent to a lot of things, but it's not true in everything. In times like we are facing today, we need stability in our lives. We need things that do not change. We need something to cling to that doesn't change. Romans 8, 37, if you will turn there with me. Uh, Romans 8, 37, 38, and 39 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I would have to believe that anything else in all creation probably includes the coronavirus this morning. We're not going to study this this morning, but none of these things can take us away from the love of God. There's only one thing that can do that, and of course that is ourselves. If we decide to do that, that's the only thing that can do that. 
Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is same yesterday and today and forever. And obviously, there's no change. To find out how Christ is today, all you have to do is to read and find out how he was yesterday. He will be the same today as he was yesterday. Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Be able to stand forever, something has to be strong. It has to be powerful. And this uh, verse in Isaiah 40 says, But the word of our God shall stand forever. These, these three words, and God said, is found nine times in the first chapter of Genesis. And it came to pass in every instance just as God said it would. And of course, you know what I'm talking about. If you go back and read the first chapter of Genesis, you will see that God said, let there be light, let there be this, let there be that. And all nine times, just simply, the word of God made those things happen. We witness all of these things every day of our lives, even today. All of these things that God said, let them happen, let them be. Just the same these things, they happen. There was power in God's spoken word to raise the dead. In John eleven forty three, when he said when he had said these things, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips, and his face clothed, or his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. There was power in God's spoken words to heal the lame. Matthew 21, 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Remember, we're looking back to the things that Christ did yesterday to find out how he is today. There was power in God's spoken word to feed the multitude. Remember the multitude of 5,000 men, where he took a few pieces of bread and a few, two or three small fishes, and he fed the 5,000, the multitude not counting women and children, which obviously would make up 10, 12, 14,000 people. There was power in God's spoken word to even control the elements. Matthew 8, 26 says, Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and the sea obey him, obey his voice? We just read verses that tell us about the, the, the power of the spoken word word of God or the spoken word of Christ, but what about his written word? He's no longer speaking to us directly because obviously he's not here, but he is speaking to us in the same way that he did yesterday. He's speaking to us by his word, and his written word is just as powerful as his spoken word. He's no longer on the earth speaking these things, but we have these things that are written. How much power that then does his written word possess. In Psalms 119, 130, it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding. It illuminates. And backing up to verse 105, also in Psalms 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The power of the written word. Now we're talking about it creates faith. It creates faith. John 20, verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. But these things are written to create faith. The faith makes us wise unto salvation. That's the reason we're all here this morning. That's the reason you all are, are at home listening. That's the reason I'm recording this lesson, because we're interested in salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. We talked about the faith in the previous verse, but Paul tells Timothy that these words will make you wise unto salvation. 
the power of the written word, it has the power to save your soul. James 1, 21 says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now we could do a whole other lesson about planting the word, scattering the seed, and uh, there's a, a parable along that line, and most, most of you are familiar with it. But listen to this verse. Therefore get rid of all moral filth, the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. The power of the written word also provides us with spiritual growth. Once we are a child of God, then of course he accepts us to, ex, expects us to grow. 1 Peter 2, 1 says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. The power of the written word will provide spiritual growth for us. Here's a good one. The power of the written word will make you clean. How many of you have looked at your hands lately and see how wrinkled up they are? We've all washed our hands uh, to some degree, I guess, but none of us have washed them probably as much as we've washed them in the last two weeks. But the power of the written word, we did that. If we do that, of course, we're making clean. We want to make sure that there's nothing on there that's going to cling to it and enter and get in our mouth or our nose or whatever. So we want to make them clean. John 51, <laughs> excuse me, said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges or prunes, that it may bring forth more fruit. And then verse 3 says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken. Clean through the word. That's what we're all interested in today. It's being clean. Not only our physical bodies or our hands especially being clean, but certainly we're interested in our in our spiritual body, our spiritual person being clean. The last thing then that I want to talk to you about this morning that is unchanging, never changes, and I'm talking about God's plan of salvation. Now, people today might want to change it, make it adapt to fit their times, fit the fit the situation or whatever the case might be. But God's plan is unchanging. We know that when God created the earth and after the flood that he spoke to his people uh, through the, head the, the, the heads of the household, the patriarchs, and then of course they distributed it down to their families and so forth. So that's how he communicated with his people. But 3,500 years ago, 3,500 years ago, uh, God had chosen this, his specific group of people that we refer to as the Israelites, and they had found themselves down in Egyptian bondage, and 3,500 years ago, Moses came on the scene. Moses came, and of course we know the story, he, he delivered them from Egyptian bondage, they crossed through the Red Sea and over into the Sinai Peninsula that is referred to as the wilderness, and of course they made some mistakes there, and they... They, they dwelt there for 40 years. But early on, when they got there, uh, they were given the law. Moses went up to the mountain, and he was given the law. And we refer to that, of course, as the Ten Commandments, or the Law of Moses. After that, 1,500 years after that, Christ came and fulfilled that law. 2,000 years ago, or 1,500 years after the law was given to Moses, Christ came, and we have the scriptures that tell us that he fulfilled that law. We know that he promised, he said he did not come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it. He came to complete it. And we know that it is worded in Colossians 2.14 that he nailed this law to the cross. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So this unchanging plan of salvation that we have has been in effect for roughly 2,000 years. It hasn't changed then, and it's not going to change tomorrow. No matter what happens to us and with the virus or any other thing that might come along, the plan of salvation will stand until the end of time. The plan that's been in effect for 2,000 years. 
Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, of course, this is Paul writing this and making this statement. He had preached everywhere the gospel that he refers to here. And he tells the Galatians that if anyone comes along and preaches anything else, any other gospel, any other plan of salvation, or anything different, let him be accursed. Verse 9 says almost exactly the same thing. And it's pretty, pretty uh, apparent that if you want to make something really, uh, make a statement and make it, make it really strong, then you repeat it. Galatians 1, 8, 1 9 says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you, then ye have received from us, let him be accursed. So it's not going to change. Paul says it's not going to change. Times change, things change, but not the plan of salvation. So then I guess the question that, that I would have for all of us this morning the obvious question would be that we must know what gospel that Paul's referring to. What gospel did Paul preach? If we, if someone comes along preaching something, how are we going to know that it's different than what Paul said unless we know what Paul said? So I guess the point I'm making is that we have to study and we have to see what Paul did, see what he said, see what he taught, in order for us to know that if someone comes along teaching something different, then it's different. And if it's different, it's not the gospel. It's wrong. It's going to be, you're going to be condemned for believing and teaching that. Things change, but not the plan of salvation. These PowerPoint slides depict God's unchanging plan of salvation. Now, if you'd like to write these verses down, I think we're going to get them up on the, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides up for you and write these verses down. First of all, uh, here is part of the, the first part of the plan. Here, Romans 10, 17. And then next is to, once you hear it, then you are to believe it. Mark 16, 16. You are to hear what, or you are to believe what you've heard. Once you believe it, then you're going to want to repent. You're going to want to say, hey, I've been doing things that are wrong, and I want to turn around, and I want to Change my life and do something completely different in Luke 13, 3. Then we are taught that we will be willing, we will be happy to confess, stand before men and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. By making that confession, you are stating something that is uh, impossible as far as we humans are concerned. That Christ came to the earth, he was born of a virgin, he lived, he died. We're making that confession that he was the Son of God. And then the last part of the plan that Paul taught, and you can go back and read everything that he wrote, everywhere he went, he, baptism was taught. 1 Peter 3.21 tells us about baptism. The, the like figure run to even baptism, baptism does also now save us, like it did uh, uh, Noah and his family uh, from the flood. And then the last part on the side here, I have faithful unto death. We are obviously taught that as Christians, we are to live faithful unto death. We are to be converted by the gospel. We are to obey the gospel. And then from there, we are babes in Christ and we are to grow. We grow when we remain faithful unto death. Uh, all the letters that Paul wrote to all the churches was an, was an admonishment to them to continue Staying faithful, continue keeping on so that you wouldn't be lost eternally. So faithful unto death is a big part of it. Two or three more verses this morning then and, and, and the lesson will be yours. Acts twenty two sixteen, and this is Paul relaying the story that happened to him in Damascus. Of course, we know what happened to him on the road to Damascus. He was blinded and led into the city. And Ananias came to him and told him in Acts 22, 16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Pay close attention to that verse. 
Saul of Tarsus was told to arrive, get up, get yourself up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The last instruction from the apostles before Christ ascended to heaven, we have it recorded in Matthew and in Mark. Now I want you to think about this. If you are leaving, you're leaving relatives or whoever, and you're going to be gone for a long time or any length of time or whatever, you have some instructions for them to say, now, I don't want you to forget this. Be sure you do this. And this is exactly what Christ did right before he left. In Mark uh, 16, beginning with verse 15, And he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel, the same gospel that Paul referred to earlier. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If you skip on down just two or three verses to verse 19, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, of course, meaning the apostles, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. They went everywhere preaching. Wonder what they preached. Wonder what they preached. Matthew gives us exactly the same account right before Christ ascended into heaven. The last two verses of the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. This morning, we're going to listen to the words of a beautiful song, and the title of it is Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. This is, of course, what I've been talking about for a little bit, about God doesn't change. God's plan doesn't change. God's plan of salvation for us doesn't change. Hold to God's unchanging plan. After the closing prayer this morning, you will see our contact information for our congregation that meets in Monticello, Kentucky. We urge you to contact us with any needs or any concerns that you might have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful this day. We're thankful for the blessings they're in. We're thankful that we have a church that has a capability to put our service online. And we thank you, Lord, for the people that have the knowledge and ability to do it. We pray for our sick, Lord. We pray that you be with them and protect them from the virus and restore everyone to their place, be thy will. We pray you be with the leaders of this nation and world. And help them make the right decisions. We pray, Lord, for a preacher church that this virus is over, we can come together and have a good preacher. We pray for Sister Betty, the death of her sister. We pray you be with her and comfort her as all you can. We pray, Lord, that 
as we finish this service that will not be very long till we can all be here together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.